Good evening. Uh, my name is Cheryl Banks. I'm the communications manager here at the Cleveland Heights University Heights Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you this evening to our public forum, Women in Politics, How to Get More Women to Run for Office in Ohio. And tonight's forum is presented in partnership with the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer, and the Case Western Reserve University Laura and Alvin Siegel Lifelong Learning Program. And tonight's corporate sponsor is First Interstate Limited. Um, tonight's moderator is Mary Kilpatrick. Um, she's a political reporter for Cleveland.com. Uh, she spearheaded a reporting project focused on the wide gender gap in politics, examining the specific challenges that female candidates face. She also covered Hillary Clinton's campaign in Ohio during the 2016 presidential race and is deeply interested in the ways women politicians contribute to the conversation. Previously, she covered schools, government, and crime in the Cleveland suburbs. She's a Tulane University graduate and a Texas native. Uh, so welcome, Mary Kilpatrick. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I began looking into the gender gap in Ohio politics months ago after looking through an online photo directory of elected members of the Ohio legislature. Intuitively, I knew that there were more men in government than women, but looking through that online directory and facing so many male faces and so few female faces was startling for me. So I started looking at the numbers. Today in Ohio, only 23 members of the Ohio House are women out of 99. That's only a little over 20%. There are only six women in the Ohio Senate out of 33. In Ohio today, the governor, auditor, secretary of state, and treasurer are all men. Ohio has never directly elected a female governor. There were four female candidates running for governor earlier this year. They have all either since dropped out or been eliminated. Women make up half the state's population, but women in politics function largely in the minority. I'm trying to understand why that is. And I'm delighted to dive into that topic with our panelists this evening. State Representative Christina Hagen is a Republican who hails from Stark County, Ohio. At only 29 years old, she is already a seasoned politician, having served as an Ohio lawmaker since she was appointed at age 22. She has since been reelected to that position three times. In 2016, Hagen was named a Forbes 30 under 30. She most recently unsuccessfully ran to be the Republican nominee for the 16th Congressional District. Nina Turner is a Democrat and a former state senator from Cleveland. She currently serves as the president of Our Revolution, a 200,000 donor strong grassroots organization created by Bernie Sanders in the wake of his 2016 campaign. Turner's name is one of several that have been talked about as a potential 2021 Cleveland mayor candidate. Ms. Turner and Ms. Hagen have little in common politically, <laughs> uh, but, but do share one common experience. Both have lost elections to former Ohio college football stars. <laughs> Professor Karen Beckwith is the Flora Stone Mather Professor and Chair of the Department of Political Science at the Case Western Reserve University. Professor Beckwith's teaching and research focuses on women, gender, and politics. She's the founding editor of the political science journal Politics and Gender and the lead editor of the Cambridge University Press book series Cambridge Studies in Gender and Politics. She is finishing a book on the gendered process of cabinet formations in seven countries, titled Cabinets, Ministers, and Genders. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I want to jump into the topic with a pretty open and direct question. Why in 2018 is there still such a large gender gap among those in elected office? Professor, I'll start with you. <laughs> So why is there a large difference in the number of men and women who serve in public office? Um, the first answer is um, there's an entire history of law 
and politics that has structured um, holding public office to the advantage of men. So we know that there have been laws throughout our history that um, forbade women to vote. You will know, of course, that Susan B. Anthony cast a vote uh, outside of Rochester, New York, I believe, and was um, arrested for doing so. I had to pay a fine, I think. I don't remember if she was actually jailed for that. But there's a whole history of law that has precluded women or excluded women specifically from holding office. And, and I, I want to emphasize that this ranges across all women. So this is regardless of age. Um, I would say also regardless of um, race, ethnicity, and immigration status. But at the same time, um, even when women's suffrage was extended with the 19th Amendment in 1920, it only included um, a small portion of women in this country. Country, um, in practical terms. So the first thing is, obviously, a whole body of law that excluded women from, from politics. Secondly, political institutions develop around who holds political positions. And so we, we can see in many ways the nature of campaigning, the development of parties, how people behave in legislatures, how legislative business is done, and how long it's done during the course of the day, and the supports provided for those who do legislative business. And I'm only talking here about legislators, but it's also true for executive positions as well. So if you have an institution that is dominated by a particular kind of person, the institution and those persons will work together so that they have a good fit for them. That fit might not be good for anyone else. So an institution that has been gendered to exclude women is not going to be an institution that's structured to be helpful or inclusive to women, even once they're elected. Um, what we can say now is um, the kinds of um, experiential and credential um, uh, variables, so to speak, that might have excluded women from public office no longer exist in, as, as, as barriers. We know that a majority of women in college, um, in college these days are female, the majority of students, that the majority of attorneys, sorry, those, <laughs> the universe of women in college are female, um, but the majority of students in college are female. We know that this is true for med school now, it's true for law school. We also know that for quite some time now, for a couple of decades, women have constituted more than um, a fifth of um, most state legislatures. Um, I will also add now that that proportion has um, come to a halt, that is, there's not been an increase in the last uh, decade, and that um, for some state legislatures, the number and percentage of women who are in state legislatures has been declining. So what we can't say is that, well, women's, women are now excluded from public office because they're not sufficiently credentialed or qualified. That's just not true. So there are a whole series of things um, across time that have kept women from public office. And I would just um, add at this point, political parties have not been good about nominating women for political office. And I'll have more to say about that later. But I, I want to say now that I was asked several years ago um, when my last book came out, Political Women and American Democracy, um, what women could do to get elected. What did women need to do in order to get elected to office? The problem is not women. The problem is parties. Once women are nominated for office, they have a good chance of winning that office. But we know that women are having a hard time getting through primaries, and it's also particularly hard for women on the Republican side. So these are some of the things that we need to think about if we want to make some changes um, and have some equitable representation um, in public office. Ms. Hagen, do you have any thoughts? A <laughs> <laughs> So as she had mentioned, um, I don't think it's for lack of merit or ability, or credentials, confidence, education. Um, it is for lack of support from the party structure. And that is largely the case on both sides of the aisle. But as you had mentioned in our scenario, and I will be the first to say that there is a harsh differential between the Democrat Party, the establishment party, and the Republican Party and how they embrace, mentor, and promote women into public office. And unfortunately, um, we just saw a very fresh case study. So I will try not to be emotional. I'll blame it on the pregnancy if I am. Um, <laughs> but in our scenario, we were by far the more qualified credentialed with legislative experience, merit legislating, and that didn't seem to matter to the establishment as it existed. Um, they were more interested in other things, maybe the pizzazz of a football player or what that might bring to the electoral process. And so I think we do have unique barriers to entry. And um, some of that is purely financial. I mean, we can knock so many doors. We can have so many town hall meetings. We can present so many polished, well-rounded ideas. 
and we can even have a record of winning race after race after race, yet the story that's told about you becomes the story that people believe. And unfortunately, um, both through the press and through the establishment party, they were able to cast a story in my scenario that I was unelectable and that I wasn't able to connect with people across the aisle. And it unfortunately wasn't based in facts because we had previously won our last election by 47 points in an extremely marginal district. Um, what my district is, the swing district in the House of Representatives, I've actually saved our caucus um, an immense amount of money over the eight years that I've served in the legislature, I've been a cost savings and a value add and have actually raised and supported other members, yet that same support structure did not exist for me when I chose to run for higher office. And so I would agree that it's not for lack of confidence, credentials, or merit that women have to offer or bring to the table at this point. It is a process of breaking down the barriers of the status quo, the elitist mentality that exists in both party structures. But as I looked at the congressional race, when I chose to run originally, um, I was told many times that it wasn't my turn, that I wasn't good enough, and that I just, you know, I wasn't ready. Yet the people that were entering didn't have the same experiences, didn't have the legislative experience, and yet they were suddenly the front runner because they were able to raise more money. Um, so I would just say we have a, um, as individuals, as a republic, we have a great debt that we owe women who are willing to step on the front lines because it is not easy and it is not always welcomed. Um, but it's so needed and so necessary. In the House of Representatives, you mentioned 23 women. Only nine of those are Republican women, and we have a 66-member majority in the House of Representatives. And when I first came in, we had about 11, and that number has shrank ever since. So there's not been an intentional drive to maintain, sustain, or grow that population. Fortunately, I grew up with three older brothers, so that never seemed to harm me when I operated in my professional environment. I just went and did my work. And it wasn't until I had a legislative aide that pointed out to me in a bill signing where we had completely restructured um, some of our legal code, and I had led on that as a non-attorney, that she said, in this picture with the governor at the bill signing, you were the only woman in the room. And there were probably 35 people, interested parties, legislators, and people from the executive branch included. So it is not for lack of our desire or drive, but there is a disconnect in our ability to get our message in front of the people. So I have a deep debt of gratitude to the League of Women Voters and Cleveland.com for putting this together so that we can share our message and hopefully change the dynamics in politics. Agreed. So uh, based on the representative's comments, we have a lot in common. <laughs> 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 we have a lot in common besides those football players. <laughs> I, I know we're very diverse. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned the if the hunts are always tells the story, then the lion's story is never told. <laughs> and that's really what this is about. And so, you know, even based on, on what the professor had to say, so if the if the hunter always tells the story, the lion's story is never told. So, you know, I need to amen just right away what my colleagues here have said and and, and just really thank Mary too for wanting to write about these stories, because we have so many reporters who don't even want to tell these types of stories to pierce our consciousness. And that's really what we're talking about. So to what the professor said in terms, it might not necessarily be illegal anymore. The barriers to entry from a legal perspective in this country are certainly not the same as our uh, four mothers in, you know, in, in, the, in the 20th century, 19th century. but the difference between de jure and de facto. And what is still happening in reality in this country is that it is still very hard for women to, one, get the courage to run, and then two, actually do it. And I love how the professor said it's the party structure. And it is the party structure, whether you're Republican or Democrat, because what the structure cares about, first and foremost, is winning. It doesn't care if that winner is a woman or a man black, white, or someone from a other, you know, one of our other sisters and brothers of color, it just cares about winning. And so until the party structures have a commitment, and I think I heard the representative say intentionality, in ensuring 
that in spaces of power that we are going to deliberately mirror society and we are going to give space or create space for communities that have been marginalized, it's not going to happen. So my message is this, we can't depend on the party structures to do this because they won't. We need you, the people, to do this. And that's why having the League of Women Voters have a form like this, because without them, we wouldn't have that kind of form. Unelectable, not my term, not good enough. Heard all of that. Heard all of that. And there's an extra layer if I just, because I'm a chocolate sister up here. The extra layer of chocolate makes it even harder. So not only is it hard being a woman in this business, when you add color to it, the hurdle, the mountain that one must surmount in this environment is even that much harder. And so we have to take all that into consideration. In the United States of America, there has never been an African-American woman elected to serve as governor in the United States of America. I want you to think about that. Wrap your mind around that. In the history of the United States of America, never been a black woman elected. In the, in the state of Ohio, uh, Democrats have never elected an African-American statewide. Now, my Republican colleagues have done it. They haven't done it in a long time, so I'm not even you know, going to give them much credit for that anymore. They haven't been getting but, but, but I will say, you know, at least they did it. But they haven't done it in a they long time. time. So we have, well, one more times than, OK? But, but they haven't done it in a very long time. And so I don't, I'm not even sure if that, you know, I'm going to count it because the person that won that. And, and even Governor Taft had, had a woman running, running made, and that's a beautiful thing. So they, they haven't done it in a long time. So I do agree that it is the power, it's the party structure. But for us as a society, we got to figure out, is this what we want? Are we going to make more demands on the political parties that we are affiliated with? Because ultimately, they have to answer to the people. And if we say that we're fed up with the way that women are treated or disregarded, then they will have to change to, to move in that position. But not my turn, not good enough. And then ultimately, this is about money and politics, too. That the one thing that the citizens of this nation agree upon that big money, the over the outsized weight of big money in politics has an impact on how the both parties perform as well. And women are out fundraised. Why? Because men have been doing it a lot longer. And so not only do they have entry into the money, they have the connections that a lot of women don't. Women are a lot older most of the times when they, when they run for office because of the stigma behind. I, I never forget when I was running, you know, when I was knocking on doors for my first office uh, as I served as a Cleveland City Councilwoman and to have older men say to me, can you do this and be a wife and a mother? Excuse me? Women make the world go round. We multitask. We are the ultimate multitask. You know, we do this for a living on a regular basis. But to have that kind of condescending question asked of me in modern times, I'm not even talking, I'm talking about in the 21st century. It happened to me last week. You know, can, can you? So, so yeah, it's hard. But the, the numbers that Mary gave, you know, six out of 33, there are even less women there than even when I served in the Senate, if you can believe that. And then the 20. Uh, out of the 99, it, it just is a poor reflection on 21st century America. And we all have a collective obligation to care about whether or not women are given just even a fair shot, or even we need to make up for lost time if we want to be real about it, about having the opportunity to serve in elected office, no matter if they want to be a member of the school board, you know, all the way up to the highest office of the land. What is our obligation as a, an American society in the 21st century to give them an equal opportunity to compete? That, 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 that's the question. You know, I want to dive into what some of you said about the major political parties and the support or lack of support that female candidates receive from those entities. What do you think could help improve the gender gap in politics? Is it the political parties? How, is it the fundraising? Is it the, the stigma? What, what can we do to help close this gap? So let me just say again, it's the political parties. Um, political, so I'll, I'll just have to say this. It's the political parties. So political science research shows that when, uh, when women 
win a primary, so they have to get the nomination first, and this is the big barrier. This is where, where women get cut out, I am sorry to say. Um, and I, I also want to say that there is a party disparity. Neither party is great on this issue. And also, let me back up for a minute. You'll have to get me back on track in a minute, Mary. <laughs> but um, we need to think about this in global terms. We're, I, I think, in about, what are we, 97th place worldwide in terms of women in our national legislature in the lower chamber. So when we think about how big this country is, how many people are in this country, how well developed this country is, how well educated women are, how is it that we are not right up in the top 10. We're not even close. We're a, we are a global embarrassment in this regard. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is the parties. Some of it's the electoral system. Single member plurality districts only give one candidate an opportunity. But that single member plurality system has elected lots of men, so there's no reason it can't work for women. <coughs> but parties do not fund women to the same extent. And I'm sorry to say, it is the case that political science research shows that the Republican Party is particularly egregious in not funding women, in not funding their female candidates. So that's, that's one problem right away. Um, there's something else I wanted to say here, Mary, but I'll stop talking because I will talk forever um, because I, I, the, 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 the data are so good. The one other thing that, that um, I do want to say is that um, it is the case for the last well, since 1992, basically, Democratic women in Congress and the House have outnumbered Republican women oh. by two to one, universally, and sometimes by more than that. And the actual percentage of women in the Republican Party in the House um, has been going down. It's now below double digits, which is, is, is appalling. And I've also done some research just recently, this is what I spent my spare time on today, looking at the relationship between party success in Congress and women's success in the party in Congress. And there's no relationship. So right now, the Republican Party controls the House of Representatives, but it has not brought women with it to that control. And the Democrats are better in terms of numbers, but there's also no relationship be be between how well that party does and the percentage of women in office either. So I'll put this right back um, on the parties this, uh, this very moment. So I'll stop for now. I'm sure I'll have more to say in a moment. <laughs> I would just say real briefly, grit, drive, determination. I mean, I was not raised in a household where my brothers were more important than me. We sat at the dinner table together and everybody's vision, everybody's goals, everybody's ideas were valued in the same way. And all of our dreams were you know, important and respective to us as individuals. Um, and we just have to keep pushing for that in our goals in society. And I think just because the party structure is able to dismount you in one run doesn't mean that you don't run again and you don't have different momentum and different experiences and an understanding how the machine worked against you. I mean, when you're outspent five to one, you know you need to raise more dollars. We now have a broader base than we've ever had because we chose to get outside of our comfort zone and run for a higher office. Um, we have a national following now. We have small dollar donors that are almost unparalleled to other congressional races in the state of Ohio. And so you just have to continue to get out of your comfort zone, even where there is inherent risk, because that's how you're going to strive ahead and you're going to change the dynamic for women, is by taking the chances that others aren't willing to take. And it means you know, also taking a sacrifice at home. I mean, my daughter and I didn't see much of each other for three weeks, and my husband was working hard around the clock so that we could strike this balance. So having a supportive network so that women are able to do this is so important. Um, it means switching from high heels to tennis shoes to carry your kid in and drop them off to your mother to get back in your heels to come to a panel like this, even after you had a loss. And there's no real potential voting advantage to be here, but you know it's important to society. It's just being present and not being allowed to be silenced because somebody was able to outspend you, not letting that change your voice, your direction, or your determination. You know, I'm curious for your thoughts. Uh, women uh, just a few months ago made up half the field for governor in Ohio, and they're all out. Um, and they have been replaced by two men. Uh, does anybody have any thoughts on that? <laughs> Mayor, I, I wish they hadn't dropped out, quite frankly. I mean, it's a, it's a personal choice, so I can't tell. I mean, I, I know two of those you know, women on the Democratic side. I, I wish they hadn't dropped out. I don't know exactly why they did, but if the calculus is purely, will I be supported and can I win, 
then the pressures that come from a party structure can force you out in those ways. And I'm not saying somebody sat them down and said, get out of the race for the sake of the party. Oh, but those kind of, oh, I'm sure they represent, don't steal my thunder now. I, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, however, it does, it does, no, it, hap no, it happens, it does happen in the political space where you're asked to, to step aside. I just wanna be very clear. I'm not saying that it happened this year in those cases. But when you look at whether or not those women would have gotten the support that they needed, and again, my original statement that for both parties, the calculus that is most important is not the diversity of the field, it is winning. And so if it's just purely winning at all costs and nothing else matters, looking historically, it's easy to try to push those, those women out. So I would suspect that they did receive some pressure, uh, even if it was just internal pressure, you know, in terms of their thoughts, to really just get out of the race. I wish they had to just ran to the end like the men did. You know, just run to the end and, and let the chips fall where they, where they may, because you, the more diversity you have, whether it's diversity that you can see or diversity of experience that sometimes that you cannot see, that diversity makes the democracy, the representative, this republic that we live in, this re representative democracy more robust, both on the electoral side and how we motivate people to come out to vote, but also on the side of the people who have the courage actually to say, I'm gonna stand up and, and run against the machine. And so it is quite sad that men have no problem with standing in the race knowing they might lose. But women do. And let me go back to credentials. People don't vote for folks based on credentials. They vote for people based on whether or not they connect with you. This is something we like to tell ourselves that let me, let me roll out the resume. <laughs> it's not about the resume. It's about whether or not you connect with people because people vote from here before they get to here. You got the best resume possible. Now, not to make this about the man in the White House, but let me just say this, sisters. If he can run and win, Nobody better ask a woman anything about her credentials. You know, I mean, that's over with. We, we qualified, period. And, and, and that's what this is about. It's not about credentials. It's about a male-dominated patriarchal society that has been crafted both in law and in reality to put up various barriers for certain pockets of, in, this popul in, this, in this country. And those barriers are higher for certain groups of people. And that's just it. And so if you're a woman, it's, you know, if you are a woman, it's hard. And then if you are a woman of color, it's even that much more challenging. So run, ladies. <laughs> and don't worry about what's going to happen in the end. Just run and let the men get out the race, Mary. Wouldn't that have been nice if some men had to jump out the race <laughs> for the women <laughs> instead of the women jumping out of the race R for the men? <laughs> Renacy got out, but he ran for... <laughs> Right, he had another landing, so I'm not going to count that one. <laughs> yes, but I, I, I'd like to say something about parties only care about winning. I don't think that's completely true. I, I think they can. I think they care about men winning. I'm sorry to say it, but I think it's the case. Well, we say so, the same thing. So is it the case? Okay. We're because saying the same I think thing. it. I, because I don't think it's the case that some of the women who are in the race for a governor might have lost. I don't think it's the case that. Um, Representative Hagan might have lost if she had been the candidate of the party. One of the things that's no, really... No, but what I meant was their calculus is that the man is going to be the one to win, so rather than to take the chance with the woman... Even they, they in they cases win, where it's clear so the woman that's, can win, that's true. parties often don't support them. So I remember this is a little sad. I think it was the year 2000. Elizabeth Dole was leading in the polls for the Republican Party nominee for president. And here's where also a helpful spouse is crucial to a woman. Um, Bob Dole said publicly he didn't think that his wife could raise enough money. And that was the end of her. That was literally the end of her. She would have be beaten George W. Bush at the point at which she had entered the race. And maybe she wouldn't have ultimately. But I think it's really interesting to see that when there aren't men in the race and women are adequately funded, they win. I mean, this is one of the things that we know across two decades now, that well-funded, not extraordinarily funded, but just well-funded, decently funded women, once they get the nomination, they can run, and if they run well, they can win. And it's often the case that there are districts in which the party candidate will win, and it doesn't matter if the person's a man or a woman, except that if they're a woman, they can be there and win. So what's important to me about, I won't tell my party affiliation here, but what's important to me is that we elect more women because it normalizes women's presence in politics. 
if women continue to be unusual, a minority in politics when we're a majority of the population, this is not going to go well for the next century. So we need to make sure that women not only run for office, and it does take guts because we know what the data look like. It takes guts to run, but for a party it shouldn't take guts to fund them, and it shouldn't take guts to nominate them. Once nominated, they'll win. So I want to talk a little bit. <laughs> I, I want to talk a little bit about the barriers facing women who seek elected office. Uh, women politicians often say that they need a roadmap to run for office because they're not typically connected to traditional power circles. Uh, men are far more likely than women to be asked to run by political actors. Is it more difficult for female politicians to get their start? Yes, absolutely. And women have to be asked. I mean, there's research out there that shows that women have to be asked over and over and over again. I remember when I was running for Secretary of State and, you know, being told, you know, and looking at the science that it's, it's better if a man introduces you at the events that you go because once he validates you, you know, then the audience will pay, you know, they'll, they'll really think you're somebody. So those kinds of things are out there in some of the research that, that groups have done. So absolutely, the, the barriers are there. And those barriers deter women from even trying to run, as I said. There's research out there that shows that women are older when they run, too. Now, some of that may just be the, you know, some of that is, is artificial, you know, because men don't think about whether or not they have a family or not, but the burden of the family is often placed on the woman. And so we find that historically women, when they do finally run for office, they tend, they typically are a little little older. I think the representative is, is, the, is, is not the, the normal in, the, in that space that usually they're, they're older than, than, the, than the men that run. I think if we had a Congress that had a child care center in Congress, the way the Scottish Parliament has a child care center on its premises, think if, if we had a legislature where the hours were, the, the working hours were from 10 until 6, end of discussion, five days a week, nothing else. Think if we had a Congress where there was subsidized housing for members of Congress so that you could actually have some place to live in DC and could get home to your family. So when we think about the structures that encourage people to run for office, and this is what I said way at the beginning, when you have an institution that's dominated by one kind of person, the institution adapts to that kind of person. But if the legislature in the United States had started with only women, that institution would look very different. So am I right in saying that in the last two weeks, for the first time in US history, a woman was able to bring her infant daughter, her infant child, onto the floor of the US Senate to cast a vote? And it took a special vote of Congress, which is really interesting. Why would that not, not just be normal? What, you know, what happens to bring your child to work day? <laughs> so again, so, so these are things that women think about when I assume, I mean, I'm, I'm not the candidate that um, Representative Turner and um, Representative Hagan are, but that's something that women think about before they run for office. Is this a welcoming institution? I did want to say one other thing. So what would it take to get us to 50-50 in the United States? Um, by my count, if I remember properly, and I don't have all of the offices included, but if we add up all of Congress, every state legislature, unicameral or bicameral, and all governorships, it would take 10,000 women to hold those offices or 20,000 women to contest those seats. We have, what is it, 325 million persons in this country and more than half of us are female. Can we not round up 20 <laughs> eligible women when Rwanda and Sweden and Cuba have half of their legislatures being female, can we not do that? And I think the answer to that is yes, we can do it if parties will nominate women and fund them. Anecdotally, <laughs> yeah, no. Y you know, anecdotally, I've spoken to female candidates who say it's difficult to tap into the fundraising networks essential to run for office. Like it or not, uh, campaign cash matters. Um, you know, I'm curious for uh, your thoughts. Is it more difficult to raise money as a, as a female candidate? 
So I've never had a problem raising money, and I've never really worked hard at it. However, when I chose to run for higher office and my money became about me excelling instead of helping others excel, the faucets were turned off. Um, the beautiful thing was we were able to meet with a lot of people who believed in our vision and get that support, beca but because of the max out limits on a federal race, you actually have a more stringent um, requirement on how much you can raise per individual donor than you do in the state legislative process. So it becomes increasingly more difficult the smaller your network is, the higher you go, because you could raise $20,000 per person in an annual year in a legislative position in the state of Ohio. But if you're running for Congress, between a married couple, you can raise $10,800 off of them over a two-year or a two-year period through the duration of the entire cycle. Half of that money can be accessible in a primary, half of it cannot. So what happens is special interests become key in your ability to succeed, whether they're going to play in outside super PACs or not. Um, unless you're in an inherently wealthy upbringing and network and you have you know, a vast amount of donors and perhaps professional football friends, uh, not to, we, not you know, not to knock you. people, but you know, it's just, <laughs> it, it is not, it's not easy. I mean, it is always going to be an obstacle. It's always going to be a barrier. Um, but again, you know, having the message, having the persistence of being available, being present, and growing your small dollar donation base, I mean, something that Bernie Sanders did, and then President Trump did alike, most people don't recognize, is grow a small dollar following that makes you formidable to the establishment party and to the special interests that inherently weigh in in these types of race races. Um, in the last week of my campaign alone, $330,000 were dumped in, um, unbeknownst to me, within the last seven days of the race by the United States Chamber of Commerce who I had a 100% voting record with in the Ohio House of Representatives. Um, there was also a dark money pack that spent hundreds of thousands of dollars within the last two weeks of the race. And so what you're talking about, um, that it's not about who can win the race. It's about who they want to win the race and who they want to carry their message and who they want to cast their votes. Um, it has very little with who can win because we won by 47 points, the race before that by 34 points, and the race before that by 22 points. We're very electable. We connect well with people. We go to a lot of chili cook-offs, and we know about cooking chili. And I've served tables. I know people. I know our community. I know our district. It had very little to do with that. What happened was you have 30 days of early voting in the state of Ohio. And when you're able to spend and market and mail your message, which you said your message is where people connect with you, when you're running in a population of 775,000 people and you can't knock on every single door, it becomes the money and the mailers and the TV and the radio that slays your opposition and sells your flowery message that defeats a person's ability to succeed in this environment. So I agree wholeheartedly that it is the dollars, it is the cash, that is the most substantial burden to overcome. And just to revisit quickly, because we are talking about women with babies in politics, I know that burden because I personally chartered it in the Ohio legislature. And it wasn't men, it was some men, mostly our leadership team, who tried to deter me from having my daughter alongside me in tow. Um, I brought my daughter at two and a half weeks postpartum to the state legislature, sitting next to a former Supreme Court justice. She never cried one time in seven months. She was fed and she was dry and she was happy. And we were able to legislate, we were able to carry bills, we were able to deliver sponsor testimony to run committees as a vice chairmanship or vice chairwoman of a committee. And there was never a hiccup in my schedule because women just prepare and we multitask and we make do. And we're not different whether our job is from 10 to 6 in the legislature or whether we're in the heating and plumbing business, whether we're in a corporate boardroom. All we do is multitask. It's what women do. It's inherently how we are wired and how we're designed to provide for our families, uh, whether it's through income or the nourishment of our children. We're prepared to do that. We're, we have a tribal instinct. And in that environment, I was treated incredibly poorly for bringing my daughter alongside with me. I received um, harassment from our leadership team, one of which was a woman who was uh, the dean of our caucus who sat in the room and told me I couldn't have my daughter alongside me. And the legal team was in the room and we had some of our HR people in the room and they, I said, what role are you referring to because I know the law and I can't have my daughter anywhere where I'm otherwise permitted to be. And they started backing down when I had the knowledge and the power and understanding of where I could be as a woman. And 
Now there are baby changing tables in the state house, <laughs> in the members lounge, in the women's restroom. There is a mother's room in the basement. I mean, when my father served in the legislature, there were not handicap accessible hotels in the state of Ohio. It was not mandated. Until people see where things are wrong and there's somebody willing to stand for what is right and what is necessary for everybody to be a part of the process, things don't change. But you just have to be present regardless of how substantial the odds are that are set against you. Thank you. How do you think we can encourage more women to seek elected office? Don't show them what they do to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have the conversations. It's important to start forums like this are really good. I know I make it my business to encourage women to, to run. But, you know, I think the representative brings up a very good point. This is also not necessarily always about gender, but it's also about mentality. Because women can be just as vicious towards other women. She gave an example of how, you know, it was a woman leader where you just think, again, just looking on the face of things, that, that she would have some compassion for your situation as a woman, and that's not necessarily so. We have to groom up and build up allies, whether they're women or men, in terms of pushing and, and seeing the value of having women serve in elected office. So this burden is not just for women. The, the burden is for conscious-minded folks in the United States of America to say that the time is past due for women to be able to compete and to compete with support. So we have to encourage women to, to run and to, to really mean that and to tell them the truth about how high the hurdle is going to be and, and what they're going to have to surmount. And you know, for me, running in 2014, which was a very hard year, I mean, I ran for statewide office, so you know, 88 counties, uh, trying to surmount obstacles in many, many ways, not just as a woman, but also as an African-American woman. So when we talk about the dollars, when we talk about the hurdles, we do, as a country, have to think about the racialized nature of the systems that have been created that create harder or heavier burdens for, for, for people of color. But I was able to, you know, you talk about, I mean, I had small do donors before it was cool. I mean, my race was a national race, and I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that I was running for Secretary of State in 2014, and Democrats certainly had an eye towards 2016. That's just smart politics. And so that uh, enabled me to have my race running for Secretary of State in the great state of Ohio. To, to be a national race, and, and I was able to have over 16,000 small donors. I raised money, my team raised money in every single state in the United States of America, including, and that's in 2014, for somebody who was a state senator, had never ran for national office, and I had to grow a donor base at the same time that I'm surmounting this heavy obstacle. So it can be done. So to hear stories from people like me and Representative Hagan to say, yes, you know it is hard as hell, but let me tell you how we did it, how we endured it, and why we, we're gonna do it again. We will not be turned around. But every single state in this country I raised money from, and including uh, Puerto Rico, too. That's a big deal for a first-time candidate running statewide. Yes, I held elected office as a state senator. Yes, I was a city councilwoman in the great city of Cleveland. But it, it is doable, and I learned so much along the way. And once you build that kind of constituency, the majority of the people who supported me in 14 or supported the representative, they're going to be there when she does it again. And so we have to be honest with women, Mary, about how hard this is, but it is incredibly gratifying too. And you do learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about society, and having a supportive spouse is absolutely right. My spouse would never get on there and say, my wife can't raise the money. What my husband says to me is that she is the best in the universe, <laughs> period. You know, that's the kind of supportive spouse that I, that I have. And so that is important to have that network. And you know, my son too, and my husband and son are here, so I gotta shout them out. Um, we come from a public service family. My, my husband is a retired police officer. Our son is currently a police officer right now now. Uh, we are so proud of him and proud of what our family has done to give back to not only the greater Cleveland area, but to the great state of Ohio. So Mary, we have to encourage people. You know, my, my dear friend Rosario Dawson once said, and I can't take this quote, it's her quote, but she said this, she said, I am here to encourage your courage. 
And that's what we have to do for women. And that's also what we have to do for men because they are being spaces that we're not in. And we need some men in rooms that, to say, you know, this is not right. We need more women. It can't just be women. So in the words of my friend Rosario, we have to be here to encourage the courage of women to get out there and run. I have three suggestions. One is, say to political party activists, why don't you nominate women for office? Why are you nominating a man again for governor? Why are you nominating a man for Congress? Why are you nominating this man? Why don't you nominate women? And we can extend that. Why don't you nominate women who are diverse in racial and ethnic terms, and in age terms for that matter? So that's the first thing. Uh, that's a little naming and shaming maybe. But challenge parties to nominate women. It's wrong not to do so. Other countries do this, and they seem to be perfectly happy. Um, we can manage this. And we certainly can't believe that political parties in this country think that American women are not as capable of women as other, in, in other countries. So the first is, ask them questions of political parties and make them change their behavior. Secondly, encourage women to run for office. And when you do so, um, start young, early and often, and say, you should run for office. You would make a good mayor. You would make a good governor. What are your plans when you finish college? Maybe running for office would be a good thing. Maybe you should think about a campaign that you can get involved in. So these are suggestions for pathways. And then thirdly, when you make these suggestions to adult women, hand them a check. Hand them some money. So almost all my public speaking since 2016 has been for young people, get ready to run for office. And people my age, get your wallets out. <laughs> Just real briefly, <laughs> I apologize. She's right. I mean, and we as women are less likely to ask for a check because we're just used to working and we don't expect, you know, we don't expect that connection to occur, but it's so necessary. Um, but something I've done in the legislature as the youngest female to serve in the history of the state is try to pay it forward. And I've done that by always extending myself to all of my classrooms and all of my public schools, all of my charter schools, all of my private schools, just if they want us as a resource to help engage and create an energy with the youth, regardless of gender, that they have a responsibility to civic engagement in our republic. And we've seen a lot of people through all walks of life that have come to the legislature and participated in government um, because they didn't really know it was the people's house until someone told them that it was. Um, and we've also hosted a ladies and leadership forum on an annual basis. And when the young women come, they say, we wish this happened two or three times a year so we could have the engagement and the encouragement and understand the data and understand what we're up against and what the obstacles are. Because I do believe that knowledge is power. When women know and understand what the obstacles are, but also understand how great the need is, they will step up to the plate to fill those deficits. But we have to present them with the encouragement and the confidence. And sometimes like the basic wraparound services, like you're saying, the financing, because it's one thing to believe in somebody. It's another thing to help them and encourage them in a way that is tangible for them to be able to connect their message with the public. I feel like we've touched on, on some of the barriers uh, and challenges that women politicians face uh, you know, when they're running for office or even you know, when they are in elected office. Um, but I'm curious, do you think women politicians face a different set of challenges sometimes than their male counterparts? Absolutely. What? Abs I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, even the way that we are judged is different. So the way that we're dealt with is different. You know, I, I shared that first example in running for council about, you know, can you, are you going to be able to be a wife and a mother? Uh, when it comes to our dress, the way we dress, I think there's also a rule in the Congress that women can't wear short sleeves or, you know, something like that in the Congress as well. But open I, toes, I, I open to, yeah, all of that is just nonsense. So now you're going to tell me how to dress. <laughs> but, you know, same thing, running, you know, for office and, and maybe having on a, a shorter, you know, a short sleeve shirt and having people of a certain generation look at that as not as professional or having women say, you know, this was said to me when I was running for secretary of state, you know, you got to have a suit on all the time. You, you can't wear dresses, you know, like the commentators on TV, you got to have a suit jacket on. Well, who said that I have to have a suit jacket on? You know, so men are not judged in that same way. Or, you know, even in election, even with with Governor Sarah Palin, and you know, no secret here that I certainly didn't agree with her policies, but from a woman's perspective, you know, the way that she was treated, yeah. 
and 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 even Secretary Clinton for that, for that matter, any woman that dares to step out there in that way, whether they're going to be judged by the hairstyle, or whether they're wearing pantsuits and not dresses, or they're wearing dresses and not pantsuits, they got a short sleeve shirt or not, is the dress you know a maxi or a mini? <laughs> Foolishness. What the what the citizens really want to know is what you stand for and what you're gonna fight for for me. But we have people who perpetuate that. Women will perpetuate that. Hear me clearly. A man didn't walk up to, you know, the men in the short sleeve, but also had women say the same thing. So those are the kinds of examples. I, you know, when I served in the Senate, I'll never forget one of the, the chairmen, and, and unfortunately, I served at a time where, you know, Republicans had super majorities, so they didn't need Democrats to, you know, we didn't have to come to the floor for them to conduct the people's business. But, you know, I'll never forget I was on judiciary and I was challenging something that was happening in committee with the full weight of Robert Rules of, of Order. And, you know, as I like to joke, I'm not an attorney, I just play one on TV. I know, I know the facts, I know the rules, and I am an extraordinary orator. And I was getting the best of my chairman, and, and he really flipped out about it. He didn't like it at all, so he banging on the gavel, you know, you know, shut up, Senator. I mean, no, he didn't even say Senator. He just said shut up. In the committee, full-fledged in the committee. My husband was in the back of the room, and I was eyeballing him just to make sure that everything was cool. I, listen, he did that, and he did not even have the decency to call me Senator while he did that. Now, I do not believe. Now, I don't know whether he did that because I'm a woman or because I'm black. I had a problem with that mentally to be talked to in that way in a committee where I had the, t the time, it was my time to talk and to have a chairman to be that so flustered that he would do something like that. So again, I don't know if it was because I was a woman or because I'm black. I don't believe that he would have done that to a man. So yes, we have uh, extraordinary barriers and hurdles to surmount even when we win the office, even when we have proven ourselves beyond a shadow of a doubt, we still have uh, these beliefs about our leadership and our case capability that many times are linked to our gender. So I, I have the similar double threat in a different way, young and female, often mistaken for a legislative aide. That's fine. It's easy to stay humble. Um, but <laughs> in the process, at the beginning, you know, I would run into the same representative that I'd sat on a committee with for six months, actually saw a sign on the way in, we're good friends. Um, sit across the aisle, but he said, you know, you keep working hard on the elevator. And we got on the elevator every Tuesday at the same time, went to the same committee together, vetted the same bills. I sat right across from him, and he said, you know, you keep working hard. And I said, okay, I, I will keep working hard. He said, no, you're a hard worker. I can just see good things in your future. And I said, all right, Representative, thank you so much. And he said, no, I'm serious. You keep working like you work, and you'll be a representative one day. <laughs> and I said, I said, sir, Representative X, I'll spare them the uh, public indecency of being harassed later. I said, sir, I am your peer in the legislature, and I serve alongside with you in the committee we'll be in at 10 AM that we've been serving in for six months together. Now, these sort of things you know, still kept happening after a couple of years. And what I chose to do was just be an expert um, in knowledge on all of the committees that I served on so that I could not be ignored because my obvious understanding of the issues would outweigh my youth or my gender or anything that could be a deterrent to anyone who thought I had something important to say. And I'll never forget we were at a forum with the Hospital Association or something over in Suma and Akron and it was a legislative panel with the executive board of the hospital and a former congressman was there who was serving in the legislature and he got so hot and bothered because I asked a question. I thought it was a pretty good question. I mean, I, I try not to ask stupid questions. And I asked a question, it was re related to Medicaid expansion and what was going on in our hospital systems. And he flew off the handle. He said, listen, if we're gonna let anybody in the room ask a question, then why even have a legislative panel with a board of executives? And the lobbyist that was hosting the event was like, they went pale in the face because they knew I was a legislator and had been for three years. And they said, uh, sir, that's, that's your colleague in the other chamber. And he, you know, for the rest of my time serving with him, I've met people with grace. And that's part of this is being able to forgive people for their misunderstanding of your ability to be just as important as them 
as a member of their same chamber because you represent a community just like they do. And it's, you know, it's just about being present, I think providing grace where people fall short and continuing to be present in an intelligent way that cannot be denied. And your gender, your color, your age, your, you know, nothing about you can take away your knowledge and your expertise of the issues because that will outshine any deficiency somebody tries to create for you, I think, every step of the way. Or at least that's been my experience. But gender, you know, I mean, it does, it does create those problems. But I always think for all of the things that I have cutting against me, um, I consider them assets in other ways. And, you know, they're, I mean, it's not always beneficial to be an old white man anymore. How sick are Republicans of being old white men? Sometimes, I mean, th they probably wish they weren't old white men anymore. It's kind of tough on them lately. You know, I mean, it's just, but everybody's got something cutting against them. I think it's just how you meet that obstacle and really address it with grace and try to bring people to where they need to be instead of allowing them to continue to wallow in stupidity. Um, you just ask them to meet you where you are instead of letting them continue to pretend you're something that you're not. I'm gonna move to some questions that we received from the audience in a, in a moment, but I do have um, a couple more questions for, for you guys. I'm curious, why do you think it's important to have a woman sitting at that table, at that committee hearing, at that meeting, um, you know, an elected official um, in government? What do you think women bring to the table? Why is it important to have a woman in the household? Why is it important to have a woman in any other walk of life? I mean, we are a value add, we're an asset, we're half of society. We're mothers, we're sisters, we're daughters. And we have an integral perspective that helps to mesh the unique mosaic of differences that we have as a state and as a nation. Um, there's no question that in the legislature, women bring value and we have you know, sometimes a different approach, sometimes a softer approach. In my case, sometimes a more bold and harsh approach. Um, I don't think that my gender necessarily defines me as a certain type of legislator, um, but it does add value to every room that I walk in, and I, sometimes I don't even notice that. Um, but I get a call from a former legislative aide who says, you know, I'm working for such and such legislator now in the federal legislature, and I really miss working for you because you cared so deeply about the people that you served. And I do think that women have a uniqueness in the level of care that we provide to the constituents that we serve, regardless of what their ask is, regardless of what their call is, we know how deeply the legislation impacts their personal life and their personal walk. And that's why I think we come to fight. I mean, we come to fight to be able to sustain our families and sustain our communities and our way of life. But women uniquely provide a voice that only women can provide by being present. And so it's just, it's important. I think in every institution where women are a minority, and not justly so, normalizes women's exclusion. So the first thing, it seems to me, that is important about having women in public office is that it normalizes that experience. It makes it not unusual to have women who are in power, who have votes, who represent constituents. So it seems to me, first of all, that's the first advantage of having women in office. It normalizes our presence in a position of power. I think that's very, very important. And then the second, and this is not just exclusive to women, to have a diverse legislature offers opportunities for justice because it offers opportunities for a wider range of experience and a wider range of insight that can be very, very helpful in policy terms. And I just know from my own very limited experience in academia, which goes across many decades now, that if I had not been in the room, some injustice would have been done because I saw something that other people didn't see. And I saw it because I'm a feminist. I saw it because I'm a woman. I saw it because I've had an experience over a long period of time. And again, this isn't just specific to women. The range of diversity in a legislature can be really important. Someone will see something that others who didn't have that experience can't see yet. And once they see it, they can understand it, and they can produce better public policy. So those are the two things I think are really crucial. And let me just also say, there's just a justice issue. For goodness sakes, we're half the population. We should be half of the legislature. Half of the cabinet, which is now almost common in advanced democracies, we should be present in all of politics to the extent that we are present in the population. 
And if people say, well, you know, women don't really bring that much difference to the legislature, it doesn't make any difference, men can represent women as well as, as, as women can represent women. Well, if it makes no difference if we're in the legislature, then we should be in the legislature. If it makes no difference, if it's a, if it's a man or a woman, why not have women be half of the legislature or half of political positions? So it's a justice issue, it's a normalization issue, and then it's a good public policy issue. This is why women should be 50-50 in all positions of political power. Well, Mary, I know you're trying to get to the audience <laughs> questions, so I, I don't know. I think for the sake of time, maybe all the panelists, we shouldn't answer the same question and we can get to more sure. because I really want to hear what they have to say. But just to add to that is class matters as well, to bring a class perspective. We are unfortunately in an oligarch in this country. And the people who get to win more likely than not are the people who have the highest connections or the most money. And that is not the kind of representative democracy that we should want to be in. So besides the gender question, because we all bring our stories with us, we bring our life experiences with us on the personal side and the professional side that can inform public policy, we also should be concerned as a republic that those who get to win the office are often those people who can buy the office. And that is across political parties. And that should scare all of us. And you know, just to, to, to give an example of something that just happened in Chicago in the in the in the in the primary on the Democratic side. It happened, you know, happens on the Republican side as well, but candidates running for governor. One candidate was able to spend seventy million dollars. You hear seventy million dollars in the Chicago primary, just on the Democratic side alone, $70 million. Now, does that mean that the other people competing for those seats weren't worthy? No, what it means is that they could not compete based on the power dynamic that is money. So you're gonna hear me say over and over again, that as a civilized society, we the collective in this country, we have got to do something about the outsized, overweight, impact that those who have the best connections or have money to self-finance get to flat out buy seats in the United States of America. That, that is the case across the board. And so even when I ran for Secretary of State, outraised almost 10 to 1 as a new person running for Secretary of State, because this person was not only football star Mary, was the former Speaker of the House, right? So, 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 so therefore, he had more connections that I did not necessarily, that I flat out didn't have. And so to, to, to level the playing field, we are gonna have to go with public financing in this country and stop letting people, even if we like the candidate, we may like the candidate that got the 70 million to spend, but that doesn't make it right that they can spend 70 million and the other people competing cannot, or that we're outraised you know, five to one, four to one, or 10 to one, and then therefore do not have the equal opportunity to compete. Class matters, and all of this money, big money in politics matters too. I'm gonna to go to a question from the audience. Uh, redistricting has been a huge issue in Ohio this year, and voters recently passed a reform uh, to the way that Ohio's uh, congressional districts are drawn. Um, the audience member is curious, how does redistricting um, affect women running for office, and perhaps how does redistricting reform affect women running for office? So one way that it would affect it has to do with um, making it difficult for incumbents to run in a new district. Um, that can cut in a variety of different ways. But the ability to remove an incumbent um, opens up opportunities for people who haven't been in office. And the people who mostly haven't been in office are women. And so that's one thing that it does. Um, it doesn't necessarily have that impact. It will depend on the way that districts are drawn. Um, but certainly the ability to make it difficult for incumbents to run in the same district where they've been protected, and, and in some ways rightly so if they've been successful and have been doing a good job. Um, but nonetheless, it opens up opportunities. And so that's a positive thing. You know, there's, there's an experience with that just this last primary in, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. The, the, the uh, uh, state Supreme Court, they required the districts to be evened up. The, the law was started behind that. And before, zero women 
uh, running for office? Five. Wow. And there's one district where it's got to be a woman because it's two women in the same district. That's because they have fair districts. Thanks for your comment. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about political parties uh, tonight and the challenges uh, that those parties sometimes present to female candidates. Um, an audience member wants to know what is an effective way to challenge political parties to, I, I believe, uh, get more women, women in office. I would suggest that your dollars go directly to the candidates that you believe in. Mm -hmm. Stop trusting in any structure that says they're for you, um, whether that be, you know, whatever institution it is. I mean, we keep giving money to an organization that says they believe in the same things that, uh, as us, but then you look at the people that are put into office and you look at the bills that are passed, and they seldom reflect the base of the voters on either side of the party. I mean, that's why we saw the Bernie Sanders and the Trump phenomenon because everyone was so dissatisfied with establishment politics, um, but people still give to the establishment party, not knowing the damage that it causes to anybody who's willing to be an individual at all. I mean, I've probably cast a vote against my party over eight years, maybe five times, and I did it quietly, and I minded my own business. Yet that made me public enemy num number one of the party because I even had the guts or the endurance to do what I thought was right, regardless of the outcome of the policy and their, you know, their reasoning for pushing it. So I think you have to support candidates that you believe in. Um, you don't empower an organization or a nonprofit that isn't doing their job. You don't empower um, somebody who says they're doing a charitable organization but really are feeding the the bureaucracy of the institution. You need to go directly to the candidates you believe in, knock doors for them, make calls for them, write small dollar checks to them. If you know somebody who can write a big check to them, make that happen too. I mean, you talked a little bit about finance reform that's needed. I saw dark money come into a race in a way that I never understood. Um, I also see, you know, with early voting, you have 30 days that you have to market yourself to somebody. I mean, it's there are so many obstacles that exist because of money in that structure that I don't know what the perfect answers are, and I don't know, you know, I don't know what the right amounts are that people can have because obviously the broader your network, the more people you can get to max out to you, and if you come from a middle income family. If you're raised in the apartment above your family, small heating and plumbing business, you don't know a lot of millionaires. It's just not the network you grew up in. So I agree with Nina that there just needs to be reform in some fashion. But really empowering individuals versus a structure is the only way that we take our parties back. And it's the only way that we take our country back from special interests and the elitists, quite frankly. A couple of audience members have asked about um, Emily's List, which is an organization that promotes uh, pro-abortion um, candidates um, who typically tend to be... Pro-choice. Okay. Well, I'm going to say pro-abortion. Okay. So anyway, it promotes candidates uh, who are typically Democrats. So they were asking about uh, outside groups who promote female candidates, whether or not that has changed uh, the uh, dynamic in politics. But the claim is that Emily's List has, has done a great deal for Democratic women. And my recollection, um, there may be list members in the room, Democratic candidates who are pro-choice and pro-ERA, uh, those were the standards. Susan B. Anthony List is pretty much the same, but on the other side on the abortion issue. Um, these organizations are really helpful. They um, organize, they don't raise money to give. They raise money from individuals and bundle them and send them to candidates. And there's a list of preferred candidates. So these have been really helpful. Um, I, I do want to say on, on the side, I think it was 1984, the Republican Party said that it would fund to the max any woman running for Congress, even if it looked like she was going to lose. That in, in the context of, public, of, of, of the Federal Election Campaign Act, that they would, and any woman who was running, they would, they would fund her to the, to the extent that the party was legally able to do so. And that's something that um, certainly that party needs to go back to, um, and, and other parties as well. But in any case, those organizations have been extremely helpful in advancing women, and particularly Emily's List. It has a long history now, and it's been very successful. I was just going to say, uh, what Emily's List stands for 
is early money is like yeast. Okay. It makes the dough rise. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which I think is very clever. And they have had a lot of success. So, yeah. Uh, another audience member asked, uh, how early do you think encouragement, sh uh, we should start encouraging girls to run for office? Preschool. As soon as they can, as soon as they can speak. Okay. My daughter's Seriously. ready. She's two and a half. I mean, she's running our household just like when I came out of the womb. I mean, we have inherent yeah. leaders. You have leadership. I mean, she's a force to be reckoned with, but it's about harnessing that drive for the good and just letting them know what they're capable of. But I don't think it's ever too early to encourage a young mm -hmm. woman to accomplish any dream she has ahead of yeah, her. Yeah, it's like any any career. We got to see running for office as part of, of a career path just as, you know, being a doctor, being a lawyer, being an engineer, being a nurse, being a teacher. All of those things should be in the career path. So we should definitely encourage our, our young girls. Uh, and the reason why I asked that question is because when I graduated cum laude from Cleveland State, it wasn't until a young lady who worked in the HR department who told me that when women come into the office, we never negotiate. And if it wasn't for her, I would have not negotiated my pay. And I was 30 years old. Now, had that been exposed to me at 17 or 16, not just from my home, but from my community, then I would have known that my counterpart, which was a male, would have come in and door with a bachelor's degree with a C average that says I want 47,000, but I was taught to know well, if you get 32,000, you can pay the mortgage, the car note, take your kids to a good school and this, that, and the other. But we're not taught that we are supposed to ask for more, not for what we need. We're not taught to ask for the things that we also desire. So when do we start to encourage the, that drive, not just the drive from a political standpoint, but as a woman, you, can, you also have to challenge yourself to ask for more money or more respect within the workplace. Thank you so much for your comment. You know, I want to end uh, to, uh, the forum and, and ask for your advice. What advice would you give to any woman uh, who's looking or thinking about seeking elected office? Well, the first is to say, good for you. Good for you. That's a great thing to do. This is a great country in many ways, and it has a great many ills that need to be fixed, and you're the person to do it. So there's, so there's a start. Good for you. You should run for office. And then ask, what office are you thinking about? How do you need to get there? Who do you need to help? Um, what's your plan? Uh, who are you talking to? Um, the sort of positive uh, contribution. I do want to say one little thing I've been doing recently. So I've been giving, not a whole lot of money, but I've been giving money to um, one specific candidate um, for statewide office um, who's a woman. And every time I give, well, so every time I get a pedicure, which my daughter insisted on, um, I give $50 to this candidate. And every time I do that, I send to my email list I gave $50 to fill in the blank. You should do that too. And so nice. I have a network, and I think most of them have occasionally $50 they can give. And maybe they do and maybe they don't. But that kind of constant encouragement, and it's not just, oh, you should run for office. It's the more positive, deeper, I'll give you money if you run. I'll help you. I'll work on your campaign. When are you going to start? If you're thinking five years down the road, give me a call in four years, and I'll be there to help you. So I would just say, don't listen to the no's in your life. I mean, regardless of gender, people are always going to tell you what you can't do, what you're not ready for, um, simply that you're not good enough. And you know, whether it was my brothers when I was a kid and there was a five-year gap between my youngest brother and I, and they said, well, you can't play basketball with us because you're too small. You've got to be the cheerleader. I was never a cheerleader. I got right in even if I was getting elbowed in the head or knocked over. And sometimes you just have to have the courage to get knocked over and get back up again and go and fight for what you believe in. So I just always encourage young people, especially women, to not listen to the negative, not listen to the no's, not listen to the people who think they understand what your capacity or ability is. Um, if we listen to that one gentleman, we knocked on his door and he said, well, I really like her and I like all of her policies, but I just can't believe she could go to Washington, D.C. and be able to manage her household with a toddler at home. Little did he know I'm pregnant with twins. Um, <laughs> but 
if we listened to that man, I wouldn't be changing things for my daughter to be able to participate in the process. I would, you know, sit at home and feel sorry for myself that I was stuck in a nursery barefoot and pregnant. Um, but simply, it's not society we live in. 40% of breadwinners are now women, and the dynamics are changing, and there's nothing wrong with that. We just have to learn how to balance our roles differently and meet the obstacles with grace and overcome them. But when I first ran, I was very young. I was 19, and the party opposed me then, too, and they defeated me at 19 just like they defeated me at 29 um, but at 19 I remember knocking doors and people saying well aren't you too young and all I thought was I think there are a lot of people that are too young that go and fight and die for our country for my right to have a voice in our republic so it's just important to be reminded of what is given for us to be able to participate in this process and then encourage people to push through the negative because there's always going to be the rewarding moment on the other side when you get to serve somebody when you get to help them when you get to make the difference that you know that you're able to make that's what has to power you and fuel you to make a difference mm -hmm. Yeah, be uniquely who you are and just know that no one can take your place. And we have to remind all of our children that, but, but especially women. You know, I often say that titles are good. They get your phone calls returned, they get you in the room. Titles are good, but purpose is better. And we need more purpose-driven people in policy areas to know that it's not widgets we're talking about. We're talking about flesh and blood. For every policy that I push, what is the impact on my constituency. And women are, I think, uniquely positioned for that, not exclusively, but uniquely. But just to remind women that they are as good as, if not even better, in the positioning to be able to, to be someone that is in elected office. And then lastly, the, the thing that I also say to women is, you know, something that my grandmother, who was born in 1913, she you know, didn't have a formal education. She had mother wit, it's what we call in the African American community, mother wit. You know, she couldn't read or write, but she could count her money. I always joke about my grandmother being able to count her money, but it's, I encouraged them to take their three bones, her three bones with them, the wishbone, the jawbone, and the backbone. And the wishbone is for hoping and praying because hope is absolutely the motivator, but the dream is the driver for us to live our dreams. There is value in the adversary, and we gotta see it that way. So your dream will drive you. Number two, that jawbone will give you the courage to speak truth to power, to lift your voice, to know that it does matter and it should matter that you are in the room and that we all are uniquely positioned, whether we're man or woman, whether we're black, white, yellow or red or some color in between, that we are all uniquely positioned and we all bring our story to the table and that story is valuable to turning things, to t turning things around. And then lastly, that backbone having the courage, no matter what the naysayers say about you, your qualifications, your stature in life, that you are uniquely qualified and positioned, but you gotta have a backbone to continue to push that through. So my message to young women is to take my grandmother's three bones, that wishbone, that jawbone, and that backbone, and that fierce women do indeed shake the world. I'd like to thank our panelists so much for joining us tonight, and thank you all for coming out. Uh, we really appreciate the conversation, and I, I think uh, it was a good discussion. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.